Uh, Steve Wright and I had a little interaction at the end of yesterday's class, and, and uh, he personally handed me this note, and the way he wrote it, it was almost as if he wanted me to read it out loud, and I asked him that, and he said, well, you just do with it whatever you want. But I do think Steve wanted to make something clear, so I'm going to help him make that clear. Um, uh, well, what he says is, Steve Wright wants to make it clear that at the end of class on Wednesday, my class, uh, he was not trying to be a troublemaker, which I want to make it clear, I didn't think he was. <laughs> so there wasn't any issue there. Um, he was not, when, when I, uh, I had misspoke, and I said that the Mary that anointed the feet was Mary Magdalene, which I don't I don't believe in any way, shape, or form. I have no idea why that name came out of my mouth. We have those moments from time to time. And uh, my mind drifted into that. And I was trying to figure out why I just said what I said. And trying to get back to uh, repealing that and correcting that like I tried to. And he was thinking the same thing. Well, it couldn't have been Mary Magdalene. And then the two of us were having this kind of... I don't even know if anybody... It's one of those private conversations that there's not a lot of words. <laughs> We're just sort of looking at each other and, no, yeah. And uh, at one point, uh, I went on, I moved on to the three days. And about that time, I looked over at him and he looked up and shook his head. And it stunned me for a second because I thought he was disagreeing with the three days, which he wasn't, he didn't even hardly realize I'd started talking about the three days yet. He was still thinking about the Marys. So we had a little miscommunication in that. Um, but he wanted me to make sure that everybody knew he, he wasn't. Uh, he agrees with the three days, and he agrees that it was not Mary Magdalene. And, and you know, we had a good laugh about it afterwards. It's just one of those things that just happens. So he, his biggest concern uh, was he wanted to make sure nobody thought he was trying to cause a problem or anything. Because he just, uh, he was just thinking... Out loud, physically, if, you make, if that makes sense at all. <laughs> okay. Um, notes went point. All right. So, where we are at, we're right on track. We're ready to start Thursday. Thursday. As far as what we can see, begins with some processes of preparing for the Passover. We're going to uh, take this from Mark chapter 14, starting with verse 12. Now, on the first day of unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, Where do you want to go and prepare that you may eat the Passover? And he sent out uh, two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him. Wherever he goes in, wherever he goes in, say to the master of the house, the teacher says, Where is the guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large uh, upper room, furnished and prepared. There, make ready for us. So his disciples went out and came into the city and found it just as he had said to them, and they prepared the Passover. This is one of the passages I was referring to yesterday when I said it's one of the truths that we definitely 100% know. The supper that he ate before the trials and before his betrayal had to have been the Passover. It couldn't have been a different meal. It couldn't have been a pretend Passover. It couldn't have been anything other. It had to be the Passover. It's expressed that way several times. Um, it can be a little disconcerting, I guess, in verse 12 when it says on the first day of unleavened bread when they killed the Passover lamb, and then you go back to the old law, and it says, uh, you know, on the, you, you kill the Passover lamb, then you have the Passover, and the next day is the beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. That can be a little confusing. But my understanding is that by this time, because the two were always right next door, because that one always followed the other the next day, the, the whole thing was sometimes referred to as either the Feast of the Passover, including the whole Feast of the Unleavened Bread and the Passover, or it might be called the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, which included the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Passover. Sometimes it was all lumped together. We do that ourselves sometimes. Um, so I, I don't think there's any discrepancy here. 
Uh, we just have to understand what they're talking about. The important part is that the word Passover and the idea of the Passover is used multiple times in this passage to indicate what they're about to do. So they're going to get together and have the Passover. John chapter 13 We talked earlier uh, at the very beginning that John is a different book. It's, it, it's not necessarily intended to be a chronological study of what happened with Jesus' life. John, it doesn't appear John intended it that way. It appears to be more of a theology, an explanation of who he was and why he was here and, and why the things he did were important. And so John doesn't spend any time really talking about the supper itself, he talks about something that happens apparently right before the supper, where he bends down and begins washing their feet. John chapter 13. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that, uh, that he should depart from the world and his father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And then it says that supper being ended, so it's kind of hard to tell whether this happened before or after, the devil, well, after supper being ended, the devil, having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, signed to betray him, knowing that his father had given him things into his hand, and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from the supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. And he begins to wash the disciples' feet uh, at some point during this supper or right after. Um, and of course, Simon Peter objects to this. This is not something that the Master or the Lord should be doing. This is something that, if anything, they should be doing for Him. But here He is, kneeling before them, and and He objects to it a little bit. He questions it. But Jesus in verse 7 says, What I'm doing you don't understand now, but you will know after this. And Peter, we're going to find He does this a lot in the next little bit. Peter says, You'll never wash my feet. Ever. That's quite a statement. And Jesus doesn't stop. He just said, goes on and says, If I don't wash you, you have no part with me. And now, for whatever reason, Peter changes his tune. And he says, Then, then wash my hands and my head also. Cleanse me all over. He objects to it at first, and now he's okay with it. Verse 10. He was, Jesus says, He was bathed, Needs only to wash his feet, but is complete, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. But not all of you. Verse eleven. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore he said, "You are not all clean." So after he washes their feet, he asks them a question: Do you know? Do you understand what I just did? And he wants to make sure that they understand. So in verse 13, he says, You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If then, if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than him than he who sent him. If you know these things, Blessed are all of you if you do them. I do not speak concerning all of you. I know whom I have chosen. But that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. Now I tell you before it comes, that when it comes to pass, when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am he. Most assuredly I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me. And he who receives me receives him who sent me. Why did he do this? He wanted to help the apostles understand that there was nobody, nobody they would ever come across that was beneath them serving them. That there was nobody, Peter or any of the others, who was going to come across that they could say, well, they are beneath me. They are less than I am. Even though they were going to have these revelations from God, even though they are going to have this authority to do things that nobody else was going to have the authority to do, Nobody is so low underneath you that you cannot or don't, they don't deserve your service. That's a good lesson for us, isn't it? There's nobody beneath us. We have a tendency sometimes to look at other people 
and judge them. Maybe by how they look, maybe by the way they act, maybe by where they live. We judge them. And we, and we may not want to consciously, but subconsciously we will act as if they are beneath us. We have to be careful of that. Jesus is very specific to his apostles. That is not how it's supposed to be with you. So then, starting in verse 21, he announces his betrayal. Yes. Uh, about this same time, he's eating the Passover. And we talked about that. I got that out of order on the slide. So now he points out Judas, verse 21. When Jesus had said these things, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Then the disciples looked at one another and were perplexed about who he spoke. They don't know who it is. Peter, this time for some reason, he's not as bold. He leans over, probably John apparently, and says, ask him. See, see who it is. So they start asking, who is it? Who is it? Uh, and in verse 26, it is he whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. And having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Jesus doesn't really say this in a way that they shouldn't understand. I mean, if we were sitting at a meal and somebody said somebody was going to do something, you said, who is it? Well, it's the one that I'm going to cut the piece of bread off and give it to them. And you reach out and cut a piece of bread off and hand it to somebody. Everybody at the table should understand that's who you were talking about. But they miss this. I think they're all so caught up and concerned with themselves and trying to figure out, would I do this? Could it be me that they miss the point that Jesus is trying to make? There's one person at the table that doesn't miss the point. Judas doesn't miss the point. Judas now knows that Jesus knows. And it seems to bother him a little bit because he, he leaves. He leaves immediately. And when he leaves, still they're not sure. Maybe he said he told him to go buy something. They realize they missed something, but they're not sure exactly what it is they missed. After he leaves, and we're going to go over to Mark for this one, Mark chapter 14. After Judas leaves, Jesus does something that is going to affect uh, religious mankind, Bible-believing people for the rest of the rest of time. He sets something up that is vital, is vital to the concept of, of honoring God, worshiping God, and remembering Jesus. Verse 22, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them, and said, Take eat, this is my body. We had it mentioned uh, earlier, I think, in another class, that Jesus sometimes gave hard teachings. And one time he gave a teaching that's, and he said this. He said, you're going to have to eat my body, you're going to have to drink my blood. And people left. They thought he was talking about cannibalism. They couldn't understand it, they couldn't grasp it, they couldn't uh, get their arms around it at all. And so they, they left him. They had no more interest in following him. We understand that he's talking about a representation. That's made very clear. Uh, by Paul and uh, in Corinthians, and and this is just a representation of what is going to happen to his body. And we'll talk about that probably tomorrow. But he's wanting them to understand. Then in verse twenty-three, he took the cup, and when he given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, "This is my blood for the uh, blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many." Assured I say to you, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Again, not literally his blood. This is representative of his blood, which is the way that the new covenant is brought into effect. A new law, something different. The old law will be done away with. The new law will be brought in. The reason this is so important and this was another question I, or a comment, really, that I received that I'll, I'll, I was going to address anyway. And he asked me, and 
I said, be sure and write it down so I don't forget it. This is the only part of Jesus' life that we as Christians are specifically told in Scripture to remember. Now we can, we can, we can glorify in the fact of the virgin birth. We can glorify in the fact of the resurrection. We can be very happy that those things happen. We can, we can celebrate those in some way. But this is the only thing that Jesus specifically says. You make sure that you remember this. You remember my suffering. You remember my death. Because that's the most important thing. It would not have been important had it not been for the virgin birth, had it not been for living a perfect life, had it not been for the resurrection. But this is the most important thing that happens in Jesus' life. This death. And the burial and resurrection that will follow. But this suffering, it, it has to be. And so he says, make sure that you remember Make sure that you remember. Then he predicts Peter's denial. And I want to go... I want to go to the book of John for this one. Because I want, to, I want to talk about what seems to precipitate something, what Simon says. And starting with verse um, 31 of chapter 13. Now when he had gone out, so it seems apparent that perhaps this is after. Um, I think I put in your outline, traveling to the garden. I don't know exactly where this happens, but it seems that they've left uh, the room. So when he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and glorify him immediately. Little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me. And as I said to the Jews, where I'm going, you cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, and you also that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. He alludes to his death, and he says, you've got to show love and concern for one another. And by the way, where I'm going, he said this before, and I said it again, where I'm going, you cannot follow me. I'm going to leave you. So Simon Peter immediately begins to speak up. So let's turn to Luke. Luke chapter 22. I'm sorry. Luke, yeah, Luke chapter 22, verse 24. Because there's something also going on in the background. There was also a dispute among them as to which should be, should be considered the greatest. If he's going to leave, he, maybe he's going to leave us in charge. Well... Who's going to be in charge? Who's going to be the greatest? So Jesus answers that. The king of the Gentiles exercises lordship over them. <coughs> not supposed to be that way among you. Very plainly, he says, this is not how you're going to act. Don't sit here and argue over who's the greatest. He'd already washed their feet and told them, no one is beneath you. No, no one is beneath worth, being worthy of your service of your time, of your help, of your of your aid, of the information you're going to have, and now you're arguing over who's going to be the greatest. So then, in verse 31, and I think, again, this is a passage we should pay attention to a little bit. And the Lord said, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. I pondered over that verse quite a bit. Satan has asked for you that 
he may sift you as wheat. We've already had discussions, and I think very, very good ones, on the idea of how God seems to, at times, collect everybody, uh, evil and good angels, and there's discussions that go, what goes on. There's back and forth. And the angels ask permission to do certain things. We see it in Job. And here, we see it in Peter. Satan has asked for you. When I see that, I kind of picture the, the uh, account we have of Job. When Satan comes before him and says, what about him? He's only serving you because. I think something similar is going on here with Peter. <laughs> Satan is going to try to get at Peter. And Jesus knows it. The Father has told him this information. And it makes me wonder... Could there be times in our lives when Satan asks for us to sift us as we tests us and God allows it. He doesn't allow it because he thinks we're going to fail. He allows it because he thinks we can't succeed. He wants to see. It's something to remember the next time you're maybe in a trial or a difficulty or a struggle. Maybe it's Satan sifting you. How are you going to come out? What's it going to look like on the other side? When he, when he sifts you, when he shakes all the chafe away, what's he going to find? Is he going to find somebody that's caving? Or is he going to find somebody that's rock solid and won't give? And Jesus says in verse 32, But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail, but when you return to me, when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Jesus prays, I'm praying that your strength will not fail. But he seems to know it will, because he says, But when you return to me, when you come back, strengthen your brethren. And we know, looking down the road, we know these stories well enough, I think, these accounts, sorry, well enough, I think, to be able to say, Yeah, Peter did come back strong. He did come back and strengthen his brethren. Even though his faith waned, he did, he did make it back and he did strengthen the brethren. So in verse 33, he said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Where, you're, where I'm going, you can't go. Jesus has just told them. Again. And Peter says, I don't care where you're going. I'm going with you. <coughs> don't tell me I can't go. Verse 34, he said to him, Peter... Before, uh, sorry, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you will deny me three times that you know. Deny three times that you know. Peter doesn't want this to happen at all. He's absolutely convinced that it, it won't happen. He's convicted in his heart that he can prevent this from happen, happening happens anyway. But he who stand, thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. We have to be careful about being so bold that we think the world is not going to influence us or affect us or we're going to be just fine out there on our own. That's what Peter thought. But he was proven wrong. Jesus told him that's not how it would be and it happened anyway. Jesus then begins to answer some questions. We've got to go back to the book of John again. John 14. He says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. He says, Don't quit. Don't give up. I'm going to go someplace and I'm going to prepare someplace for you to follow me. You're going to come with me. And that precipitates a series of questions by different people. Thomas seems to start it out, at least the ones we have recorded. Thomas says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? I mean, that's a logical question. If I was at lunchtime to tell somebody, well, meet me for lunch, and then just take off, they're not going to know where I'm going. That's where they're feeling right now. They, well, if you're going someplace, tell me where, so that I know how to, I can figure out how to get there. And so Jesus says, when he's asked the, 
what is the way, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but my people. I'm the way. Don't worry about trying to, to, to figure out where I'm going. Just follow me. Just, just follow me. And he follows that up with, if you'd known me, you would have known the Father also. So Philip asks in verse 8, show us the Father, and it's sufficient for us. Show us the Father. Let us know what's going on. And Jesus says, have I been with you so long, and you don't know me? How many times has he told them, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, and he tells them again, says, how can you say, show us the Father? You should have already seen the Father. If you've heard me, you've heard the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you believe in me, you believe on the Father. In the Father. Then in verse 22, Judas, the other Judas, not Iscariot, says to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? How are you going to show this to us and let us know. And he says, if anyone loves me, he'll keep my word. And my Father will love him. And we will come and make our home with him. If you want to, if you want to know the Father, you have to know Christ. And Jesus is very, very plain about that. Then he goes into a series of teachings on relationships. A series of teachings on relationships. He covers three distinct areas starting with chapter 15. He talks about the relationship of the believers to Christ first. And he uses the vine and the branches analogy. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch that is in me does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he, fruit he prunes so that it may bear more fruit. There's a connection here, he says, between... Me and you, the believers. I'm going to supply what you need just like, just like the vine supplies what the branches need in order to produce grapes or fruit. If you cut the vine off, now it doesn't have access to the nutrients it needs and it's going to die. But any good vine dresser, any good, any good uh, grower of trees... A plant knows that once in a while you've got to cut away some things in order for that plant to thrive. So he says even if you do produce fruit, you're going to go through troubles because those, those difficulties are going to help you produce even more fruit. It's going to make you more productive. There's this relationship there of connection. Then he talks about, starting in verse 12, the relationship of believers to each other. Here's the relationship of me to you, vine to and uh, branches and the relationship of you to each other in verse 12 this is my commandment that you love one another the relationship that's going to happen between the believers is based on love if you love each other like I have loved you and then in verse 18 he talks about the relationship of believers to those that are not believers to the outside world and he sums it up in the first verse this way, in verse 18 this way. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Those that are trying, we just had a good explanation or discussion on that. Those that are trying to follow the Lord, trying to be Christian... They're going to have trouble. They're going to have persecution and conflict. You know, there's another thing that goes on in this series, both in the questions that he answers and in these teachings. And I want to point this out. In John chapter 14, because it keeps happening all the time through this section. In John chapter 14 and verse 16, he says, and I will pray the Father, and He will give you another Helper, that He may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees Him nor knows Him, but you know Him, for He dwells with you and will be in you. Then over, down in verse 26, 
But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. In chapter 15, verse 26. But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me, and you will bear witness because, of the, because you have been with me from the beginning. In chapter 16, verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And then he goes on to explain that a little more. And then down in verse 13. However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you of things... To come, he will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. There's two things that I, I want to point out about those passages. One, Jesus, during this time, right now, in the garden area or on the way to the garden, wherever he's exactly at, I can't be sure, but somewhere in that area, close to the time of his death, close to the time of his denials anyway and arrest, he is emphasizing over and over and over, I'm not leaving you alone. The Helper will come. The Holy Spirit is coming. Here's things He's going to do. He's going to teach you. He's going to help you remember. He's going to comfort you. He's going to strengthen you. He's going to allow you to do things. He doesn't want them to think that He's just... A lot of those questions were precipitated by the fact that He said He's leaving and going somewhere they can't go, and they're afraid they're going to be by themselves. They don't know how to answer the Pharisees and Sadducees the way he has been doing. They don't know how to interpret the law the way he's been doing. They can't do those things yet. The other side of that is the phraseology that Jesus uses every single time. Did you notice it? He. He. And hopefully you've discussed this in your congregations or you've heard it discussed in meetings like this. The Holy Spirit is not an it. Jesus refers over and over and over to He and Him. A personality. Just like the Father, just like the Son, just like the Spirit. A personality, a, a, an entity that has substance. Not an it. A He. He. I just wanted to point that out. I find it interesting that Jesus continues to use that phraseology like that. Okay, then in verse 16, he again gives another prediction of his own demise. A little while and you will not see me, and a little while... And you will see. I'm sorry. I'm going to start that verse over. A little while, and you will not see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me, because I go to the Father. Is that confusing? A little while, you're not going to see me. But then, in a little while, you're going to see me. And they're they are confused. Verse 17. What is this that he says to us? A little while, and you won't see me. Again, a little while, and you will see me, because I go to the Father. What does this all mean? He said. So they ask him, what is this a little while? We, we just don't understand. So verse 19, are you inquiring among yourselves? Jesus knows before they even ask the question. About this a little while. Verse 20, most assuredly I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. That's going to be at his death. You're going to weep and lament, but the world is going to be pleased that I'm gone. At least they think I'm gone. They're going to think I'm dead. And you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned to joy. A little while after your sorrow, you're going to be the ones happy, and the world is going to be the one that's panicking. And we see that happen, don't we? We see that in the crucifixion, that, that the world, that the people there that want Him dead are rejoicing. I can picture the... the uh, uh, <laughs> I can picture the chief priests and Pharisees upon his death walking away going, well, we fixed that. 
Now they have the the tomb sealed because they're concerned about the whole three day prophecy. But they figure they've got it licked. The Jesus problem is over. And then a few days later, they're bribing people to try to keep what happened a secret. And they're and they're scared. He's back from the dead, really. Okay. We're going to have to keep moving. John uh, chapter 17, Jesus begins to offer some prayers. It says, Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said. The first thing he prays for is he prays for himself. Not being selfish, he's just very ordered here, very, very specific. And so he mentions, he, he talks about, and I, and I believe these are prayers that he's saying out loud so the disciples can hear him. This is not a private time. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son also may glorify you. He knows that his death is imminent and his death will glorify the Father. And, and, if, and if that can happen, it's going to be good. It's going to be beneficial to mankind. It's going to succeed in the plan that's been from Genesis. This is the culmination of everything that has happened up to now. Starting with verse 6, I have manifested your name to the men who you have given me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. And now he begins to pray for the disciples. Keep them in you. Help them remember me. I know what verse, uh, verse 10. And all are mine and yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. He prays for them. Verse 17. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Make sure that they know the truth. Make sure they can teach the truth. Make sure they stay on the truth. This is what's going to glorify Christ, and then eventually glorify the Father. It's the truth that they're going to speak later on. And then in verse 20, he begins to pray for all believers. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That's us. We're reading these things. We're seeing them through their eyes. We're experiencing them through the words that they wrote down, and through the words that the Spirit has given them. And we're able to believe on them because of those things. That's us. And he prays in verse 21 that they may all be one. That's a very common prayer of Christ, isn't it? That those that follow Him will be one. Not one because of tolerance, like we heard a little earlier. Not one because I'm willing to put up with your wrongs because you're willing to put up with mine. One in the fact that we are all one in the same belief. Paul talks about this, right? One body, one hope, one faith, one baptism. Unified in that. Unified in the truth. Not just unified in some field. Alright? Okay. This is all happening in uh, on, on the Mount of Olives. There's a, a picture of the Mount of Olives. Right? It would not have looked like that when Jesus was there. This is with... Uh, a lot of the modern buildings and things that are around. Monuments that man has put up that God doesn't approve of. And again, I want you to re- remind you, I put this up before, but I want to remind you of the view that he had from that area. He's able to look down over the temple and see the way things are, knowing the way that things should be and knowing what's going to be going on in Jerusalem in just a few hours. And right now it appears is when he makes his way into what's commonly referred to as the Garden of Gethsemane. This is a a picture of that garden area. Those trees look pretty old. I don't know how old they are. I would guess most of them probably weren't there when Christ was going through this. 2,000 years old is the old for a tree. But the idea, I just I like this view of the area because this view doesn't have, there's a lot of 
modern sidewalking and paths and all this stuff. And this one, I think, gives a more raw picture of perhaps what it was in Jesus' day. Just a calm, peaceful place of olive trees, flowers, nice place to relax. Probably one of the reasons we went there a lot. Plus the view that we just saw of Jerusalem. So it's now at this point that he goes off by himself a little bit. Mark chapter 14, starting with verse 32. Then they came to a place which is named Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. And he took Peter, James, and John with him, and began to be troubled and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch. He went a little farther, and fell on the ground, and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Never, nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Luke records for us, in his account of this, he records to us that angels came and tried to comfort him, to encourage him, to strengthen him, to prepare him for what was about to come. And then he was sweating, it says, great drops of blood. He is in intense mental anguish here. Emotional pain. Possibly the likes of what we can't really completely understand. I, 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 I've had my share of problems in life, and I've had my share of disappointments, and I've had times when I agonize over things. I don't think I've ever been in this much emotional and mental torment as what he's going through. What's about to happen? Why it's about to happen? The results of what could happen if he messes this up somehow, if it doesn't go, if he fails. There was that possibility. He, he's struggling with all of this, and he's looking for comfort in, in calling out to the Father. And he comes back in verse 37 and finds them sleeping. Could you not walk with me one hour? Could you not stay with me? I promised you a helper. I promised you a place I'm preparing. I promised you all these things. And you can't watch with me one hour. You can't stay with me. You can't help me and support me. So then he warns them in verse 38, Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Isn't it interesting that he says that apparently to Peter, when Peter thinks he's pretty strong right now doesn't understand how we he's beginning. He does this three times. And in verse 41, he comes to them and says, Are you still sleeping and resting? It is enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us join and see my sinner, or see my betrayer is at hand. I know there's no greater and lesser sins in God's eyes. But in our human eyes, one of, the, one of the most horrible sins is about to commit, be committed right here. The betraying of our Lord. He's going, to give, he's going to give Him up for basically nothing. Matthew chapter 26. While he was still speaking, he told Judas, one of the twelve, this is verse 47. While he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now his betrayer had given them a sign, saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one seeks him. Immediately he went up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. kiss of friendship was probably exchanged many times between Jesus and Judas over the past few years, however long it was. And now it's a sign of betrayal. They take him by force 
However, verse 51, and suddenly one of those who were with Jesus, and we know this is Peter from other accounts, stretched out his hand and drew his sword, struck the servant of the high priest, and cut off his ear. Jesus said, Put your sword in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you not think, or do you think that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he will provide me with more than twelve legions of angels? How then could the scripture be fulfilled that it must happen thus? And in that hour, Jesus said to the multitudes, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple, and you did not seize me. But all this was done that scripture that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Jesus makes a point to Peter and to the others. This is happening for a reason. The scriptures have to be fulfilled. This was predicted. This was foretold. He even tells the people that are coming to get him, you, you are satisfying prophecy. You just don't know it. You don't understand it. Nobody had this thought in their mind that the Messiah must die. It didn't make sense to them. All right. So he is led away to Annas. Um, John, John chapter 18. Starting with verse 12. The detachment of troops and the captain of the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. And they led him away to Annas first. For he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. They take him to, this is kind of, this, this interested me when I started really looking into this. And I asked the question, I asked two questions of myself. First of all, why call Annas the high priest? He's not the high priest. Caiaphas is high priest. The passages make that very clear. But yet, the scripture continues to refer to him as the high priest. But what I could find, or what I could, uh, I think there's two reasons. First of all, out of respect. We do this in our society. We've got a judge, or a general, or a president, or somebody with a, a, a title, the right titles attached to their name. And even after they're no longer in that position, we continue to refer to them that way. It's just a matter of respect. So it, it probably was part of that, but I think there's a little more to that. It, I think it's also practical reality. If you look at the politics of the day and what was going on, Caiaphas was the high priest. But he was high priest because the Romans had gotten frustrated and upset with Annas enough that they removed him. They basically told the Jewish leadership, if Annas remains high priest, you've got problems with Rome. And so they pr promoted Caiaphas to high priest, and Rome said, that'll be fine. Notice that Caiaphas is, uh, how is, how is Caiaphas related to Annas? Son-in-law, not his son. They didn't want the bloodline, but they compromised. Son-in-law will do. And so Caiaphas is high priest because Annas kind of got out of sorts with the Roman government. Because of that, Caiaphas has the title and the authority and the power and is wielding it with every ounce of his being of high priest. But he leans a whole lot on Annas. Leans on him for decisions, leans on him for instructions, and the people listen to Annas. People pay attention to him out of respect. So, that's why Paul Annas the high priest, why take him to Annas when Annas has no authority? Well, I just started into this a little bit before I was wanting to necessarily. He's, Annas is, so, is, is very savvy politically. He lasted a long time as high priest. If I understand, if I, if I read correctly, longer than some. And he understands a little bit how to deal with the Roman government. He did it wrong enough times that he got himself into trouble. But he seems to understand what's going on. So he was high priest for many years. And 
taking him to Annas first could have the potential of keeping Caiaphas out of it. This is going to be a mess. And the, and the Jewish leadership understands that. That's why they've taken so long to act. That's why they wanted to do this as secretly as possible. They're afraid of the crowds. They're afraid of the Roman government, how they might respond. They're afraid of everything except Jesus. They want Him dead. And that one goal has led them to take some pretty drastic measures, we're going to see. <clears throat> pretty drastic measures. So they're trying to keep Caiaphas out of this if at all possible because if Annas can't get a confession from Jesus that will satisfy the Roman government, then they might be able to leave Caiaphas out of it at least until it comes time to give the formal charge and put his name on it. But also, if something goes wrong and Rome is not happy, Rome might not take action against Caiaphas, they might just get mad at Annas, and Annas really doesn't care. Because he, he doesn't have a lot to lose at this point. And Caiaphas does. So this is all done, seemingly, I think, in, uh, in, a, in an effort to protect the true high priest at the time, Caiaphas. And we're going to have to leave it there for today. Because our time is up. So we'll come back tomorrow and look into what happens with uh, the trials and the other things that are going on. I've been told to tell you uh, there's going to be singing again like there was on Tuesday. If you have to go to the bathroom, go. But if you don't, just stand up, stretch for a second, and get ready to sit right back there.